We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So yes, I'm going to talk to you primarily, I'm going to start with uh, a discussion about what fear is, because my views on this uh, have crystallized in recent years. And um, th if you know anything about what I do, you probably don't really know what I do, because uh, it's been misrepresented quite a bit over the years. So, um, so fear, I think most of us will agree, is an awareness that uh, there's a threat to well-being well that's present or imminent. And this can be in the form of these kinds of biological or social cues uh, that have the potential to cause us harm. And when we encounter these kinds of threatening events, a lot of things happen in our brains and bodies uh, that uh, some of them are recognizable by others, and that's how we uh, judge someone else as being fearful or anxious. But others are more internal, and we can only judge in ourselves in terms of body, move, uh, body um, uh, responses. Uh, of course, we can measure these objectively if we hook a person up to some sort of physiological recording. But the most important part of fear is the internal awareness that you're in danger. Now, the traditional view of how this comes about, and I'm partly responsible for this, uh, is that this part of the brain called the amygdala, which you heard about uh, a bit earlier, is a fear center. That is uh, a view that is widely uh, uh, cast in the culture and in the scientific circles as well. Uh, the idea is that the threat in the outside world is processed by sensory systems. That reaches the amygdala. It arouses the state of fear. And fear causes these behavioral and physiological responses. Now, when I talked about fear as being involved in the amygdala, which I've done for almost 30 years now, the idea was that what the amygdala was doing was processing implicitly or non-consciously threats, and that the conscious experience of fear was coming about through a different mechanism, which I proposed was uh, in the neocortex, and I'll describe that in a bit later. But what got carried forth in the scientific and lay culture is that I said that fear is in the amygdala. Uh, and I think that this is wrong. And that's what I want to help clarify as we move forward today. So what's wrong with the idea? Well, the, the idea is based on two kinds of observations. One is that when a person or an animal uh, is, uh, ha has some problem with their amygdala, they no longer respond to threats in, the way that, uh, in a way that you can measure, like behaviorally or physiologically. And secondly, uh, when an animal or, an, or, a per, or a human is exposed to a threat, activity increases in the amygdala. So these two things kind of suggest that the amygdala is processing threats, and that has led to the conclusion that the amygdala is the source of fear. But that, I think, is a leap that's too far to make. So why is that a leap that, uh, that's too far? Well, behavioral and physiological responses uh, don't always correlate with subjectively uh, reported experiences of fear. 
Medications that are used to treat fear and anxiety are more likely to change behavioral responses like avoidance or timidity uh, and physiological responses like hyperarousal than the subjective feeling of fear. And as a result of, of point two there, all of the major drug companies are pulling out of the anti-fear, anti-anxiety medication business because they view the results uh, of, of uh, efforts to develop new and better treatments as a failure. Uh, they don't consider uh, a reduction in behavior and physiology a success because the patient doesn't feel less fearful or anxious, so the therapist is disappointed, the patient is disappointed, and uh, the drug companies are disappointed. <laughs> so number three, threats elicit, elicit amygdala activity and behavioral and physiological responses in the absence of subjective awareness that the stimulus exists, as in Nick Humphrey's famous blind sight uh, situations. Uh, in humans rather than monkeys, though, uh, and without any feeling of fear. So this can be done uh, through studies of blind sight, but also uh, through studies of so-called subliminal um, uh, presentations of stimuli, where stimuli are presented very briefly or masked by some other kind of stimulus. The stimulus is present. It's a threat. The person uh, doesn't feel fear, and yet the amygdala is still activated, and the responses are still expressed. Fear is not the cause of those responses. Uh, and finally, in the uh, damage to the amygdala in a human eliminates the behavioral and physiological responses, but not subjective feelings of fear. So all of this, to me, suggests that fear is not coming out of the amygdala, but someplace else. So I will put an X through this, uh, this fear circuit view and I, will, I first want to redefine what the amygdala does. I think one way to, to describe it that is semantically more neutral and doesn't uh, imply that fear is, is, is uh, emerging, bubbling up out of the amygdala, is to simply call it a defensive survival circuit. Every animal has to detect and respond to danger, as we heard about birds uh, being able to uh, detect and respond to danger, and I was happy to hear that fear didn't come up there. It was described as um, uh, responses to danger and threat. Uh, so every animal, from a worm to a human, has to be able to detect and respond to danger in order to stay alive. Even bacterial cells have to detect and respond to danger. So detecting and responding to danger has nothing to do with psychology. It's there to keep the organism alive. And if you have some kind of psychology because of the kind of brain you have, then you become aware that you're in danger and you experience fear. So threats activate a defensive survival circuit that non-consciously controls defensive responses. And humans have inherited this def defensive survival circuit from animals, but not the conscious experience of fear. So if the amygdala is not the source of fear, how does it come about? I'd say it comes about like any other conscious experience. Now, we might argue about how that comes about, and there are some experts in the room that may not agree with me, but uh, my own position is that um, once we understand consciousness, we'll get an understanding of emotions for free. Um, so my shot at it is something like this, which goes is an idea that really started uh, when I was doing split brain work in uh, the 1970s as a graduate student. And I won't go into that, but the idea is that, uh, and I, I proposed this model in 1984 before I did any research on fear itself, but the basic idea is that the threat comes into the brain and it's processed through different kinds of channels. There are connections from sensory systems into this defensive survival circuit that control these behavioral and physiological responses, and then to cortical areas uh, where you have processes like attention and working memory that can put things together and hold them in mind. Uh, and one of the things that can add into, uh, that can be added into working memory is the fact that this defensive survival circuit is active and that uh, you're getting feedback from the body and so forth. And all of this kind of coalesces in the mind uh, to make fear a cognitive event, not an innate feeling inherited uh, from animal ancestors. So I'm not saying that animals have no conscious experiences, no subjective experiences of fear or anxiety or anything like that. But if they do, they're probably very different from the kinds of experiences uh, we have. Um, some of the things that, um, uh, well, so why is this kind of theory uh, needed? One, for one reason, uh, fear doesn't have an exclusive contract with the amygdala, which is generally thought to be a kind of predatory defense system. Uh, 
We can be afraid, we can have fear from starvation, dehydration, hypothermia, reproductive isolation, each of which depends on other survival circuits. So the, the key is not that the amygdala is activated, but that you have some kind of activity that threatens your existence or potentially causes you harm. Um, so what we feel depends on what kinds of signals are being processed in working memory, including signals from, from uh, survival circuits, but other signals as well. So rather than having a kind of subcortical circuit, one for each kind of basic emotion, uh, I propose that the cortical cognitive higher order representation uh, uh, of information accounts for emotional and non-emotional experiences in one kind of basic system. And I won't have time to go into any of the evidence for all of this right now, but I'd like to make it, uh, um, analogize it by, by explaining how you make soup, which you all know. You take water, onions, garlic, carrots, all kinds of ingredients, put them into the pot, and none of these are soup ingredients. They're things that exist in nature that when combined in a certain way, make soup. And I think emotions are like this as well. We have lots of things in our brain that are there for various reasons, like sensory processing, survival circuits, brain arousal, body feedback, attention, semantic memory, episodic memory, in implicit fear schema, monitoring, awareness that you are in danger, interpretation. Most of these have nothing to do with fear or emotion. They're simply things that exist um, to allow you to um, uh, accomplish other goals. So when you put them together in a particular way, uh, fear is what results. Now, this kind of re-schematizes uh, all this. On the left side of the diagram, we have things that would be contributing to regular old conscious experience, non-emotional states. And on the right side, there are ingredients that begin to tilt it into in a kind of emotional direction. Um, and you can see the survival circuit uh, multiplicity there that can generate activity that will help tilt it in one way or the other. Um, but the, I think an important, there are a couple of important things on this I want to point out. On the two sides of the vertical uh, line there, self schema and emotion schema, I think these are both, both very important. Unless you have an awareness that the danger is happening to you, there's no fear or any other kind of emotion. In order to be emotional, you have to realize that it's you that is experiencing this situation. If you know, a threat might cause you to respond in a certain way, but if you don't know that it's happening to you, you're not afraid. Um, now you might say, well, I can be afraid or worried about my children if I see them in danger, but your children are in effect part of who you are. As are the, William James says, you know, a man's yacht is part of uh, who he is. Uh, so <laughs> I think, you know, we, I would be very happy, unhappy if I lost my guitar because it is such an important part of, of who I am. So I think self, self schema are very important, but also emotion schema. As the child grows, begins to grow up and, and experience the world and come across dangerous situations, uh, they're told what danger is, they may experience danger themselves, they observe it in, on TV and in movies. They build up these schemas about what danger is and when fear occurs. So that when you have these kinds of schema, it's very easy to pattern complete the entire representation of what fear is with just a few or maybe even one element. If a threat is present, you're probably moving into towards a, a cognitive pattern completion that the situation is one in which you're feeling uh, fear. Add in the fact that escape is not possible and that your heart is beating fast and so forth, and bingo, you've got the whole thing closed up. So the idea that emotions are cognitively assembled states made by the information available to working memory is related to Levi-Strauss's notion of bricolage. In French, this means to uh, put things together, items that happen to be available. He emphasized the importance of the individual, the bricolure, and the social context in the construction process. Others note that uh, maybe persons, objects, contexts, the sequence and fabric of everyday life or the medium through which emotions come into being, a day-to-day -day kind of emotional bricolage. In the brain, working memory can be thought of as the bricolure and the content of emotional consciousness as the bricolage. So if emotions are cognitive events and circuits that differ in significant ways in humans and other animals, including other primates, then emotions we experience, including emotions related to death, may be unique and unparalleled in the, in the animal kingdom. Add language and culture to the emotional equation and the case strengthens. 
So animals may have subjective experiences, but can't have the kinds of experiences we have, or at least that's how I think about it. So second part of my title is, is fear of, de is, uh, is fear of death a fear? Fear, formally defined as the awareness that a threat to your well-being is present. Anxiety is the expectation or worry that your well-being may be compromised in the future. Many situations described as fears are really anxieties. But fear and anxiety are really conjoined twins. Even in a clear case of bodily threat, quick, uh, fear quickly morphs into worry about the future. A snake at your feet causes you to freeze and feel fear of bodily harm, but that's soon complemented, if not overtaken, by worries about what will happen if you're bitten. Will you die? Uh, will you get to the emergency room in time? Will they have the antidote and so forth? And death is always in the future, so it's a worry or an anxiety rather than a fear. Fear and anxiety are products of the same cortical system in my theory, um, but different subcortical circuits are part of what makes fear and anxiety different. Specifically, subcortical circuits underlying the processing and control of bodily responses related to immediate or certain threats versus future and uncertain threats are different. Um, in the case of the, uh, in the immediately present threat, the amygdala is very important. In the case of a future threat, an area called the bed nucleus of the stereo term analysis is important. Now, the bed nucleus has become, for anxiety, what, fear it, for what the amygdala is for fear. It's been viewed as the source of anxiety, but it's not. Like the amygdala, it detects and responds to threats, in this case, threats in the future. Fear and anxiety are the cognitive interpretation that these things are happening. So why does it matter what we call uh, these things? First of all, why does it matter what we call fear and anxiety? Uh, why can't we just use one word and or just maybe just even use them interchangeably? Um, for one reason, the um, problems that, that afflict people that have these conditions um, need to be treated differently if the threat is a worry about the future as opposed to a kind of uh, um, oversensitivity to immediately present stimuli. But in the case of, um, of fear of death, or anxiety about death, the imprecision in scientific terminology, while a constant problem, uh, uh, it, it can be easily be avoided by being clearer about the language. So in treating someone, say, who is obsessed with death, um, or in designing treatments that might help people who are at the end of life and uh, needing to not be quite as anxious about it, uh, thinking of these things in terms of what's going on in the brain can actually be more constructive than simply assuming that it all happens in the same way. And that's my two cents about fear of death. Thank you.